Charles. Charles laid in the leaves, trying to be as still as possible. He looked back over his shoulder, and he heard and he saw the movement of the largest rattlesnake he'd ever seen. Its head was moving side to side with its tongue just coming out just as quick as you can see. Quick, quick. Its tail was rattling as a warning. And Charles tried to stay as still as he could. It got quiet. But then a sharp pain ran through Charles' leg down to his ankle again. And he kind of, he moves just enough to make some leaves kind of make a noise. And then he hears the hiss again and the rattle of the rattlesnake. He begins to pray to himself quietly, Dear Lord, please help me, please help me. And the sound of the rattles and the snake seemed to get closer and closer until all of a sudden, BAM! A shot comes out. A rifle had shot, and that rattlesnake lunged, jerked, moved around, and then lay dead. Charles didn't know what happened. But as he looked back over his shoulder, there standing above him, dressed in a black and red flannel shirt, with jeans rolled up to his knees, with his lumberjack boots laced just below his knees, with suspenders and muscles that bulged out from everywhere, there was Terrible Tim with a rifle in his hand. And the end of the rifle was still smoking, and a small little wisp of smoke was coming out at Charlie didn't know what was fixing to happen next. But Terrible Tim reached down and he asked him, are you okay? And he says, my leg is hurt. I twisted it. I think maybe I hurt it or sprained it or broke it. And before he knew it, Terrible Tim had reached down and scooped him up with his powerful, strong arms, put him in his arms, held his rifle in the other arm, and off up the path he went toward the shack. Charles didn't know what was going to happen. I threw his mind, he was thinking, gun, the knife, I'm going to the shack to be with him by myself. What's going to happen? As he got closer to the shack and walked up the steps and he came to the door, Terrible Tim took his big boot and he kicked at the door and it opened and he went in. And when they went in, he laid him on a cot over there on the side near a window. Charlie looked around and it was, the cabin was dark, but he could make out the image of a small little pot belly wood stove over near the middle of the room. There was a small crude made table there also with a chair. Off to the side was a little cabinet that had a bowl and a, a pitcher evidently for water, a few cans of food and an open shelf that had been made probably out of some barn wood. Terrible Tim said stay right there. He walked over to the room and he hung up his gun on a nail. And he said, I'll be right back. I'm fixing to get some wood. So out the door he went. There wasn't much light. It was very dimly lit by a kerosene lamp. As he looked around, Charlie began to think, oh, what's going to happen? Will Grandpa Preston and Red find me? As he looked closer around the room, another table was off in the corner. And there was somebody there. And he looked closer. And it was a boy about his age who was staring back at Charlie, wide-eyed, but in his hands, he had a knife, and he had a small piece of wood. And in his lap and around his feet were small shavings from some carving he was doing. Next to his chair were two crutches. And Charlie said, quietly. Hey. He said, hey, my name's Charlie. What's your name? A little bit reluctant, a little bit slow. The little boy said, my name is Christopher. He says, uh, how are you up here? Why are you up here? He says, that's my uncle. Tim is my uncle, and he's taking care of me. He says, well, what brought you here? Why do you live up here by yourself with your uncle? And Christopher began to tell him a short little story about his life, how that he had been raised on an Indian reservation 
And that's where he learned the skill and the craft of carving. And just two months ago, his parents were killed in a tragic accident. And the only person left in his family was Uncle Tim, who could take care of him. So Uncle Tim traveled out west, got him, and they rode a bus back. And that's when Christopher came to live up on the top of Shadow Mountain on Shadow Ledge. Charlie said, well, tell me about how you learned to carve. He says, well, I took every day because I couldn't walk and I couldn't play like other kids. And my parents tried to protect me, and now my uncle's trying to protect me. I learned to carve. And then we would take those carvings and we would sell them. Charlie, kind of wondering, says, well, how did those packages get in the tree? And Christopher said, I, I, I saw y'all down playing. I saw y'all running around the fields and in the pasture, chasing the frogs and the chickens. And I just can't do that. But I wanted someone to come and just play with me, to be with me, because I'm really lonely up here. And so, so I put those packages, hoping you would see them. I saw you that day coming toward the mountain. I said, maybe they'll come up here. Maybe they'll find me. And so I took the first package, the deer, and put it in the tree. And I thought you would make it up here without Tim seeing you, but he was at home. And then I saw you come the next day, and I tried again with the little beaver. But I'm, I'm sorry you got hurt, but I sure am glad you're here. At that point, Charlie began to think why he had come up there. He had wanted to be a witness to Terrible Tim, and so he reached in his pocket, he still had them, and pulled out the track. Christopher hobbled over after he picked up his crutches and came and took the track from Charlie. And he sat down and he said, what is this? He says, it talks about God. It talks about God's Son and why his Son came to earth and why Jesus loved us so much that he gave his only Son to die. Just then, Terrible Tim comes back in the door. Clunk, clunk, clunk. The sound of his boots. And the door opens and as he walks in, his arms full of wood. And he says, sit back down. Be quiet. And he looked over at Charlie and said, Now, when your par grandparents get up here, I don't want you coming up here anymore. I don't want you telling anybody about Christopher. I don't want to see you here again. He went over and started a small fire in the pot belly stove. About that time, there came a knock at the door. And Tim walked to the door and opened the door, and there was Grandpa. Grandpa was with his neighbor. And behind them was Red and Preston. Tim invited them in, and they took Charlie. After Grandpa said, thank you so much for your help. And they had made a litter. A litter is kind of like a stretcher. You see, um, Preston, the Boy Scout Preston, he had learned about first aid and how to make a litter. And so they took some blankets and some poles and they wrapped it in a special way and they loaded up Charlie in that. And they took the slow trip down the path, down the mountain, and back to the farmhouse that evening. When they got back, Shug had already called the doctor, and Dr. Singleton had already come over. And he looked at Charlie's ankle, and he said, You know, it's not broke, but you've got a bad sprain. Let me do this. You need to rest tonight. Put some ice on it. I'm going to wrap it up, give it some compression so it won't swell as much. And I want you to keep it elevated. Preston says, Ah, I knew of that my first day class. And so that night on the sofa, Charlie rested. They brought him some dinner on a little TV tray and they set it beside him and he ate dinner. And he began to talk to Grandpa and the other boys of what he saw up on Shadow Mountain. He told them all about Christopher. He told them all about the carvings. And he told them about that he left the tracks. And then Charlie began to say, and you know what? Maybe they'll get saved and we will accomplish what we went there to do. Grandpa said, Charlie, be careful. Be careful why you think or your motivation for sharing the gospel. Be 
careful that you think you're the one that's going to bring Tim and Christopher to Christ. Because it's God, His Spirit, that works in people's hearts. Charlie was a little bit embarrassed by what he'd said. And began to think about it. Well, the boys helped him upstairs into the attic. And he lay in bed. It was kind of a painful kind of walk as he hobbled up through there. As he lay down, he fell asleep. And all that week, he'd been on the farm and he'd been thinking of the garden and our hearts, how they're gardening. He began to think and again, all of a sudden, he drifted off into a dream. And as he dreamed, there was a plant growing. And the plant at the very top had a, a leaf on it, and that leaf said self. S-E-L-F. And in his dream, he began to think about it. Self. What does that mean? And he says, when we plant seeds of self in our life, then out comes this plant. It's all about self. And all of a sudden, a leaf grew off of that plant. And it was the leaf of self-glory. And Charlie began to think about how he wanted the attention of everybody. How he wanted people to praise him. How he wanted people to have a testimony and say, we're so thankful for Charlie and all he does and how he witnesses and how he goes to Sunday school and how he went to vacation Bible school. Self-glory. And then all of a sudden, another leaf sprouted up. And it was the leaf of self-will. I want to do it my way. I want to do it how I want to do it. I want to do it in my time. I want, I want, I want. And the leaf of self-will grew next to the leaf of self-glory. And then another leaf grew. The leaf of self-pity. Because sometimes things go wrong and Charlie began to think, you know, I don't always do and accomplish what I want to do. And in his dream, he began to think about self-pity. Oh, I'm, it's just terrible. All the things I have to do and the things I have to endure and the things I have to work through and all the problems I have. And he began to have a little pity party. The leaf of self-pity. And then the last leaf pops out and grows. And it's the leaf of self-confidence. Probably the leaf that Charlie struggled with the most. In that he thought, I can do anything. I can do this. I can handle this. I can handle this problem. I can overcome this situation. I can bring that person to Christ. I can be as winsome and make them think and just they want to be a saved no matter what. I can handle the, the little issue that's going on with my friends. Everything I can handle. And the leaf of self-confidence. And as Charlie was dreaming this dream, he looked at the plant, and there was no fruit on the plant at all. Just leaves. And what good was the plant? And in Charlie's dream, he began to think, plant has no value. There's nothing good. The plant of self eventually died. Charlie wakes up. He wakes up with kind of a sweat. And he wakes up kind of trembling and scared. And he wakes up just kind of shaking a little bit. He begins to think about his dream and he prays, Dear Lord, don't let me be caught up in myself. Don't let me be thinking about myself so much that I exalted above my hands. Lord, may everything that happens be done for you. Even while we're here, even this hurt ankle, Father, may it be for your glory. And if your will is that Tim and Christopher come to know Christ, help me to understand it's because of you. After he finished praying, he leaned back into the bed leaned toward his pillow and his eyes traveled back out the window. And there was a cool breeze and the curtain was moving just slightly. And his eyes began to travel across the pasture 
and the pond because the moon was shining brightly again that night and it comes to the bottom of the mountain and as his eyes travel up the mountain and he looks about three quarters of the way up the mountain all of a sudden Charlie screams out loud as he can he says Grandpa Red Preston hurry it's on fire and tomorrow find out what was on fire.